What I want to look at this morning is what does it take for a group of people to come out on top? To, to win. What makes a winning team? If I were to title this, it would be the winning team. Now, we're going to look at this particular group of people. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start off in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And what's happening here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're going to be reading verses 15 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 15 through 20. Now, let me preface this with what's taking place. Moses is about to turn... God's people over to Joshua. He's already, they've wandered the desert for 40 years. And right before he turns everything over to Joshua, he has a closing thought, a closing challenge, if you will, for his people. And this is what it says, starting with verse 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Verse 17, but if your heart turns away, you are not obedient. And if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Verse 19, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life. That seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? So that you and your children may live. And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here we have a formula for success. Here we have a game plan for a winning team. God, through Moses, is telling these people what they need to do to be successful. If all of this is true, why is it that these people wandered around the desert for 40 years to get to a place? Look, they left Egypt, the promised land from Egypt is the same distance as Laredo to Waco. I, I, I did the, uh, the little map uh, analysis. And if you take, it's the same distance. Now, read the story. The Bible says that when they left Egypt, they went straight to the promised land. But when they saw it, they were afraid of the people there, and they didn't trust so God makes them wander the desert for 40 years. Now, in order to figure this out, we need to do a little backtracking on these people. I'm going to do this very, very quickly because I don't have a ton of time. But and we're going to go back. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Now, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to read all this to you because it would take too long. But in Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, we have the story of Noah. 
And the people, it says here, now the earth was corrupt, and God saw, and in, I'm sorry, and the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, and all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So he sends Noah. In chapter 11, still Genesis, chapter 11, first book of the Bible, still Genesis, Nimrod builds the Tower of Babel. In chapter 12, God finds Abram. And he tells Abram, I want you to go. I'm going to turn you into a mighty nation. See, God starts figuring, let me get at least one group of people I can focus on, and they'll help everybody else. In chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abram and says, you're going to have like the stars in the sky or the sands of the beach. That's how many offspring you're going to have. Genesis chapter 17, God takes the covenant to another level and he changes Abraham's name, I mean Abram's name, to Abraham. Also in this situation, God adds uh, another step to the covenant. And he tells Abraham now that himself and all the men that are under his authority, that they are to be circumcised. Why did God choose that? That's for another study. Can you imagine the staff meeting that morning with Abraham after his encounter with God and he's getting all his men together to start their work day? Oh, by the way, besides taking the sheep to the south field, uh, we're going to go through circumcision. <laughs> that would have been a very interesting staff meeting to be at. In Genesis chapter 21, we have Isaac. In Genesis chapter 22, we have Abraham's Big, big test. See, God was doing a lot of prep work to make sure that this group of people could handle the job. He wanted to make sure that this group of people would be that winning team. That's what he was after. But when you begin to study their life and study the history of God's people. There's so many ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. And so finally Moses is all done. And he says, look, look, I'm done. And here I'm, I'm, I set before you life or death. Hey, choose life. Do what's right. And God wants to bless you. Look what it says here. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years. It's God's desire to bless. After that long speech, he pretty much turns to Joshua and says, Tag, you're it. Black, black, no take back. They're yours now, man. Now, <laughs> that's a funny thought if you think about it. That really is. God doesn't leave Joshua on his own. Listen to what God tells Joshua as now we're going from Moses to Joshua. Jo Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Listen to this. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to obey everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong 
and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now we see that book of the law. What are we talking about? We're talking about God's word. We're talking about God's word. This book of the law, God's word. And it tells us right here, (laughs) the command, be careful to obey everything. See, that's the problem a lot of us have. We want desperately for God's word to be multiple choice. We want to pick and choose. Oh, I like that part. Oh, I don't like that part. Oh, I like this part. I don't like that part. We want to be able to pick and choose what parts of God's word that we can walk in obedience to and what parts can be blown off. We want to look for loopholes. That's how we are. We want to look for little loopholes in the, in the law or in the rules. To, uh, w- w- and What can we get away with and still be blessed? And God told Joshua, obey all of it. Obey all of it. What was Joshua's first challenge as he came into the promised land? It was Jericho. Jericho. Talk about your first challenge. Jericho was a city with a wall that surrounded it. Now, it... According to biblical archaeologists, they say that Jericho's walls were so thick and so big that chariots could race on top. And then they were building houses up against the wall. When Jericho saw the God's people coming across the river and they were coming, they were, man, they closed up. And they were scared. And God tells them, tells Joshua, I'm going to give you that city. It's yours. If you do what I tell you to do. Now, most of us know this story and God's instructions. And let's be honest, God's instructions were kind of strange. March around the city once a day for seven days. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times. On the seventh time, have the priests blowing their trumpets. And on that last time, everyone give a shout and the walls will come down. I don't know a ton about construction, but that doesn't sound like that should bring it down. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But see, God's not obligated to explain everything to us. We're obligated to walk in obedience. When we walk in obedience, the walls come down. And if you read the story, they followed Joshua, they walked in obedience, and the walls came down. It's amazing stuff. And all over God's word, from Genesis to Revelations, we have story after story after story of what happened when people obeyed God, but we also have story after story after story of what happened when people did not obey God. We had the obedience and the disobedience. Now, after Joshua's life, leading these people and the task and again not much changed up and down and up and down with their walk with God Joshua gathers all together his job is almost done and here's what Joshua tells him this is Joshua chapter 24 verses 12 through 21 and look at what this is what he says now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. 
throw away the gods of your ancestors. I'm sorry, the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates are the gods of the Amorites in whose land we are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, as parents, a lot of us need to make that statement. There's a lot of parents that want to let kids pick and choose whether or not they want to. Listen, we need to pull a Joshua here. Joshua didn't have a family meeting when he made that statement. He just said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Verse 16, then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord and to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our parents out of Egypt and from the land of slavery and perform, performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and, and, and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us the nations, including the Amorites, who, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord before, because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is holy. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve other gods. Again, clear. He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But all the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, look, you're telling me, yes, you're going to serve the Lord, but you need to understand if you choose not to, if you choose to rebel, you will be punished. This is not a popular topic right now. People don't want to hear about punishment. And they don't want us to say anything that, okay, well, because you're not serving God, God's turning against you. But biblically speaking, the Bible's very, very clear. When we choose not to walk in obedience to God, we are choosing to step away from his protection. Yes, he's loving. Yes, he's merciful. You want evidence of that? Jesus. He makes every effort for us to live a life of forgiveness. He sent Jesus. And Jesus is mercy. Jesus is grace. But we can't change the fact that God is holy. And asks us to be holy and to walk in obedience. You know why they wandered the desert for 40 years? They were being filtered. By the time the 40 years was done, by the time the 40 years was done, all the original whiners and complainers and rebels and the people who gave Moses such a hard time and the people who stirred up the people against God were dead and buried in the sand. God filtered them. 
does he have to filter us? We need to stand up and make a choice. See, we, we see these people, but also see the Joshua's, see the Noah's, see the Moses's, see the David's, see the Samuel's, see all the people who chose to walk in obedience. And how God blessed and God moved. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I'm wrapping it up. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Listen to this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. How do we become a winning team? By following the winning instructions. That we choose to get on our face before God, humble ourselves, and that word, that phrase, turn from wicked ways, that means we don't turn completely around. If it's over here, we go over here. We don't, we give it up. And then we got to seek and serve. See, God's desire is to bless us. God's desire is to prosper us. I love the way he tells Joshua, do not turn to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. See, that's God's desire. Why? Because he's a dad. God's a father. How many fathers don't want their kids to win? How many fathers don't want their kids to be successful? God's the ultimate father. You have been designed by God to be on the winning team. You've been designed by God to be prosperous and successful. That doesn't mean you're going to have a huge house and have lots of money. No. No. It means you're going to be blessed by God, which is more valuable than the biggest houses or the most money. Look, there's nothing wrong with those things. Thank the Lord. You got them? Praise God. But let me tell you something. I don't necessarily have them, but I am prosperous I'm successful. I'm blessed by God. I love doing what I do. There's no greater job on the planet than being a children's pastor. I'm telling you, I wear that children's pastor title like a badge of honor. I like it a lot. And I have children who honor me, not because I'm special, but because I've made a choice. There's time for you to make a choice. When you choose to walk in obedience to God, you don't have to be afraid of the COVID-19. I'm not saying you're not going to get affected, but I'm saying you're going to win. You're going to overcome. You're going to be on the, the winning team. I want to encourage you. Go for the winning team. Now, I'm going to pray right now. And again, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, when this door was open for me and I began to ask the Lord, what do I share? He brought me this. He brought me this. I'm telling you, this is God. And it's God's desire to bless you. Now, if you're here today and maybe 
You're not serving God at all. Maybe you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Well, I'm going to tell you what I tell the kids I work with. It's not hard to do. Right now, we can say a prayer and we can say it together. And don't let the simplicity of this prayer fool you. It's the most powerful prayer out. Because this prayer transforms. And I'm going to say that prayer real quick. And if you're listening right now and maybe you've never made a commitment to Jesus, then I'm not judging you. But by making that statement, you've confessed you're not on the winning team. To join this team, we pray together. And I'm going to say the prayer. And if you repeat this prayer with me, you join the team. So with you heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to challenge you to join this team. And we're going to pray together. And it goes like this. You say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Jesus, I know you're God. Thank you for dying for me and coming back to life for me. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean and fill me with your spirit. Help me live for you. I want to be your child. From this day forward, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer for the first time, please contact the church. Let us know. If you have questions, if you need answers, we can help you. Please contact the church. I'm going to pray a blessing over everyone. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for all you do. And Father, we thank you that it is your desire that we be winners. It is your desires that we be prosperous, that we be successful. Father, give us the wisdom to walk in obedience to your word. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.